My name is Bob and I'm the, um, let's see here. Yeah. <laughs> you got some experience with that. Awesome. And I'm a, um, a Dharma student, and so uh, Lama um, Jimpa, who is our teacher here, he, um, as students, he gives us the opportunity to get up and give talks, you know, and I, um, I'm not a Dharma teacher, you know, I'm a student, and I'm here to share, you know, my experience as a student. And so I, you know, you know, a lot of times he'll give us um, the topic that, um, to talk about, but I chose the topic today, and the topic is is death and dying. And it, it um, you know, it's something that I think about a lot, and I and I, um, you know, it's something that I I constantly am uh, like using in my daily practice to try to to keep my practice kind of strong and and good. And so um, it's funny too because I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, why talk about death and dying? You know, I mean, why not just like live our lives, you know, and and uh, and try to have as much enjoyment as we can, and like not think about it. And then, you know, at the end of our lives, you know, we just, we just, you know, you know, some, you know, whatever circumstances happen, we we just, you know, pass away. And it's like, it's kind of like the circumstances that most people are in. You know, we don't really think much about death, and almost in a lot of ways, we try to like avoid thinking about it because it's a painful thing sometimes to. To think that, um, you know, our children, our families, the people that we know, you know, could be gone like in an instant. But I think the reason that we talk about death is because it, it makes our life much more rich, you know, and it makes it, um, it makes our Dharma practice a lot more rich too. And so um, I'm going to give you a little bit about my background. And uh, so I, um, you know, I work as a nurse and I, um, you know, I came out of school several years ago and I, um, you know, I was a Dharma practitioner at the time and I felt like I had like, I was pretty solid with what, you know, I was doing. I had my practice and I, and I meditated and, and I'd gone to a lot of teaching and done some retreats and I got out of school and I took a position as an ICU nurse at UC Davis, you know, and I thought, man, I'm like solid and I'm ready to go, you know? And I mean, instantly I was overwhelmed, you know, not only at what I had to learn to do my job, but also like, you know, all the suffering that was around me, all the stuff that people were going through the, um, you know, a lot of times when, when there's traumatic events that happen, people's families maybe aren't very functional to begin with, and then everything just explodes. And so I, um, you know, I, I, I started to observe, you know, like what was going on, you know, and I, um, you know, and I would, uh, it was, it, it was interesting because we put all this energy into all these life-saving things. And then once we realized that we couldn't really keep people, people alive or save them, we just like, it was, we transitioned to another phase, you know, and, and it was, it's really interesting. And I was thinking about Lama Jimpa's talk a few weeks ago, and he had talked about how, like, you know, sometimes there's really just nothing to say you know, to help people. Sometimes what we need to do is just bring them a glass of water or do something is just so basic as like just being there for people, you know? And I, in my awkward, not knowing what to say, it was like, I, I, I kind of learned how to just, just to try to be there just to try to like listen to people's stories, you know? And a lot of times our patients were, you know, unconscious and their, um, it was really their family members that were like the patient at that point. And so, um, you know, the other thing I noticed too, a lot of my coworkers, you know, it was always like people would like look for a reason. Whoa, well, they were in the wrong, they were doing this drug or they were doing this or they were doing that. It was always like everybody was looking for an excuse to say, that's why they're in this position. And like, it can't hurt me, you know, like it can't affect me because it's somehow, you know, their circumstances, you know, cause this, you know, or, well, what I noticed was a lot of people did a lot of things that distance themselves from from this idea that like death is very close to us. It's not something that's like far off. And so, you know, I um, I had my own personal experience with death, you know, in my family, and it was uh, it was with my mother, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I, I hadn't really had anybody that was close to me that had passed away, you know, and it was. Uh, 
it was very shocking, you know, when she was diagnosed with cancer, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I, I was really close to my mother, you know, and I, I was in my 40s at this time, and I had, you know, two kids that were like five and three, and she was this really solid rock in our family, you know, and she, um, she got diagnosed with cancer, and I, and I, um, I just couldn't believe it. It was like, well, how could she, like, have cancer? How could she, like, be terminal? And, uh, and I felt like a lot of the things, I, I, I had this, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but I could feel a lot of the things that she was feeling, you know, the isolation that she felt when, when she got her diagnosis, you know, and how everybody had this kind of real sympathetic feeling towards her and every, I mean, she was real. it's like when you, she was very isolated, you know, she was alone with her grief and with her pain. And I, um, and I thought to myself, you know what, it's like, it's funny how like you get this diagnosis, but like, we're kind of all in the same boat. You know, we're all really terminal in a way, you know, and maybe it's, maybe we haven't gotten this diagnosis, but we all are facing ultimately, you know, leaving this earth. And the funny thing is too, is I, I've worked with people at work who, you know, had these really bad diagnoses, and then other people that I work with passed away before them. And so it's kind of funny how like, you know, we really don't know, like, when our time is going to come, and we don't really know, like, the circumstances around it. A lot of times we look at people that are older than us, and we think, oh, they're going to, they're going to go before us, but we don't really know that, you know, we don't, we have no um, idea about, like, when the time of death, you know, is going to come. And so, you know, when, when my mom was, um, when she got real sick, you know, my wife did this thing that was, like, one of the biggest gifts that anybody's ever given to me. She told me, you know what, you need to go down there and be with her and you need to go to, you need to take a leave of absence and you need to go down there and like spend time with her and try to help her in whatever way that you can. And I was really kind of hesitant. I was like, man, my family's got all these crazy things going on. Do I really want to put myself in the middle of that? Can I just go and like be with her, you know, on the weekend or at different times? But I, but I, I took my wife's advice and it was, it was a hard thing. I mean, our kids were little, you know, there were little kids and she, you know, took all that on. And so I went down there and I, I took a leave of absence and, uh, and I, and we sat and we talked about all kinds of different things that we'd never talked about before, you know, and again, I could feel her pain and the things that she was having to leave behind. And you know what I did was I did the medicine Buddha practice. That was the thing that, um, that I, I really, that gave me a lot of strength, you know, at that time. And she was, uh, she was a Catholic, you know, she was Christian. And I didn't, I didn't do the practice with her, but I did it, you know, at her house, sometimes in her room when she was, you know, sleeping, you know, and I recited the mantras over and over and over. And I felt like it, it kind of really grounded me and gave me some peace and strength to be able to do what I needed to do. And I'd like to think that it also provided an environment where things were kind of calm to a certain degree. And so, um, you know, when she passed away, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was really dramatic. And my sister, um, who was there, she said, she said, you know, this is a lot like giving birth, you know, and I, I can't really, I didn't really understand hundred percent of what she was talking about, but I kind of, I kind of felt it too. It was like all this energy, you know, of, of just her trying to let go. And then finally, you know, her passing and just this big release, you know, and it was definitely, it was definitely a sad time, you know, and it was, a uh, you know, but it was like, I felt like I did something beneficial and, uh, and I saw it, I saw it through. And the really hard part was that, um, you know, after she passed away, you know, I had a really frick, I had a really hard time for a long time with this grief, this really like intractable grief. And I kept thinking about all the things that happened over and over in my head. And it was almost like a compulsive, you know, loop you know, with her and how she passed away and all the things that went on. And, and I, you know, I went to counseling, I, I did practice, I did all these different things to try to overcome this grief. But it was interesting, one day I was at work, and I was sharing my story with this friend of mine. And, uh, and she was somebody that I trusted, and she was in a little bit older than I was. And she told me, she goes, you know, she goes, my mom passed away when I was in high school, you know, and she was, a, her mom raised her, and she didn't have any other family members and she um went to live with her um 
her friend's family. I mean, she had a friend in school and she went to live with their family and her mother said, I want you guys to take care of her. And it was really interesting when I was listening to her story, it was like I had all this compassion for her situation. And this big shift took place, like inside of me, I was like, man, everybody has mothers that pass away. You know, everybody has mothers that they love. And this woman who, um, who was really young, didn't have very much time to spend with her mother, you know, who she really loved. And it's funny, intellectually, I knew all that stuff beforehand, but my connecting with her in this shift, like dissolved a lot. I mean, it didn't dissolve it, but it, it, um, it shifted all this grief that I had and it helped me to kind of get over, you know, this, this place that I was kind of stuck in. And so, um, I don't know, I think in, in my mind, that was kind of like a, a little bit of a, like a bodhicitta compassion moment that helped kind of dissolve some of this, um, you know, I, I don't know if self focused is the right word, but just kind of being stuck. So um, with those two like situations, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think that um, I've thought a lot about like, what what is it that we can do to like try to benefit people, you know, who are, um, you know, who are, who are sick and who are dying. And, and, uh, and it's, it seems like a tall order because I, I don't really, I don't feel like I have like, like all these words of wisdom to give people, but I think that there are a lot of things that we can do for people. And so I, um, there are also a lot of great books, you know, I mean, as you can see, you know, from, you know, um, you know, Kubler-Ross all the way through all the different like Tibetan books on dying and, and, um, and, uh, you know, and it's also kind of a central focus of this, um, this tradition, you know, and so the book that I really like is called How to Enjoy Death by Lama Zopa, and it seems like a very odd title, right? I mean, I, even when I saw it for the first time, I was like, oh my God, how to enjoy death, you know, and, but it's, but there's a, there's another line, so it kind of softens it a little bit. Preparing to meet life's final challenges without fear, and I was like, all right, okay, now Lama Zopa, you're, <laughs> you're kind of on the same plane as, a lot of us, but I think what really what the book says to me is, is how to have a peaceful death, you know, and how all these different um, things that we can do to like, to try to um, like come to terms with um, having a peaceful death. And, and I talked to, um, I talked to Lama Jimpa about this subject, you know, that's kind of the process that we do is, uh, you know, we come up with the topic, maybe we have a couple of months to kind of um, think about it. Um, we ask him some questions, you know, to try to get some clarity in, in the direction that we're going. And, uh, and then he um, character, characteristically gives us these very short answers. <laughs> and the reason for that, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a Zen student thing, I think a little bit. It's like, the reason for the short answer is because you have to go and do some work, you know, and it's, and it's meant to be kind of like, like, I don't know if difficult is the right word, but it's meant to have some, um, some struggle, you know, and so I definitely struggle with it. And so then, so when I asked him, um, you know, well, what, how can I illuminate this topic? He, um, and, and how can, so how can we have, you know, a peaceful death and how can we prepare to um, have a peaceful death? You know, he talked about training, you know, and, and part of the, um, some of the stories that in the book and in other books that I've read, it's like, you know, people tend to, um, to die in the way that they lived a lot of times, you know? And so part of our whole thing of being Dharma students is we're trying to train to, um, to have some focus and concentration and compassion for other people too. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that we're trying to accomplish through our training. And, uh, and he particularly, um, focused on the components of like the Lojong training, which are basically um, the trainings around um, developing intense compassion for people and, 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 and training our minds to, um, to have that compassion and have that motivation as part of our, like who we are, you know? And, uh, and I remember talking to him one time about, you know, being sick and what it's like to be sick and, and, and terminal and, he was telling me the story about how he imagined himself in a hospital bed and like the nurses coming in to turn him 
and how he had this real compassion for this nurse. Oh, she must be have been working like for 10 hours in a row and she must really be tired. And and I was thinking about it. I was like, wow, that's that's like the training is you're not you're not waiting until you're in that position, but you're you're thinking like, you know, someday that this is, you know, it's not just somebody else that this is happening to. Someday this is going to be me, you know, and and uh, and practicing with that idea in mind. You know, the other thing that came into my mind too was this idea of like adversity. You know, we all um, we all have adversity in our lives. You know, and and uh, and and part of it is that's the thing that helps us to train. You know, and it feels like sometimes like there's way more adversity than I can handle. You know, and but that's the thing that really gives us the um, the ability to face these kind of difficult things that happen in our lives down the road. And and I think that. Um, you know, having to say goodbye to our loved ones is part of that um, the adversity that we're kind of training towards going forward. You know, the um, the other element of of uh, you know how do we have a peaceful death? You know, I know I noticed with my mom, she she really struggled to let go. You know, and I know, and the thing is, we all have to let go. You know, we all have to let go of this world and all these things that we really like have like strong attachment for. And it's almost it's almost better to start doing that now, you know, and and how can we do that now? It's like, you know, appreciating like like the real like immediate things, you know, not um, not grasping really tightly and and always like holding things really tightly and it's and it's it's really easy to say this but it's really not very easy to do this you know and i think about um i think about my own family you know my kids you know my wife like but the reality is is that um you know those it, the time will come you know and, and now is the time to practice it and so i'm gonna um i'm gonna read a couple of quotes from this book because i i think it um probably says it better than I can say it. All right, so this is a, um, this is a quote from, uh, it's called, the title of the section is called Giving Up Attachment and Enjoying Death. So we don't wait until you're close to death to practice renunciation. If you practice in your daily life, freeing your mind from the bondage of the emotional pain of attachment, your mind will be trained. You will be like the military, preparing to defeat the enemy whenever he attacks. Practicing in daily life, you train the mind not only know to know death in its definite, but also that it can occur any year, any month, any week, any day, even in this moment. If suddenly death comes right now, you will be prepared. There will be nothing to bother you, nothing to upset you or to get you angry about, and nothing to regret. No reason for sadness for your death will be easy. You will be able to guide your consciousness to the pure land of a Buddha or a good human rebirth. So, I mean, these are all, these are all like nice concepts, but I think that um, the reality is, is that, you know, hopefully we have a lot of training that we can still do, you know, and hopefully we have a lot of uh, a practice that we can still do. And so the other thing, element of this talk though, and I kind of briefly touched on this was uh, like, how can we help people at the time of death? And I was thinking, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, my own death or demise or whatever you want to call it, you know, I think having support from people, you know, and especially from, from communities of people, you know, and, uh, and, you know, there are so many like different practices that we can do for people when they're when they're sick, you know, and they can't leave their homes or their, um, you know, and then and so part of the second half of this book is all about that, you know, all the different practices that we can do for people at the end of their lives. And, uh, and I'm going to just read through the index or the appendix because it's really interesting. So um, what Lama Zopa recommends is uh, like having like objects that the person can see, you know, and if they're, I mean, obviously if they're not Buddhist, then, you know, having objects that they kind of connect to, you know, that, that, um, that are peaceful, you know, if they're Christian images of Christ, but in the sense of being Buddhist, the objects that he recommends are statues, um, pictures, um, cards with 
images of Buddhas, um, visible mantras, you know, having texts around stupas, prayer wheels, um, blessing cords, um, you know, it kind of goes on. You know, also what, um, what he also includes are all the mantras that we can say for people who are, um, who are sick and dying too. And so he lists them all out, you know, some like Medicine Buddha, Avalokiteshvara, some of them are, um, are common ones that we've heard of. A lot of them are, um, are Sanskrit mantras that I've never heard of that are really super long, you know, maybe somebody could, at some point could help us elaborate on that. But the other thing that he has listed in here are, um, are prayers that we can do for people, you know, and they're, um, there are several of them that we've done for people before here. Um, the King of Prayers, which we would recite on New Year's, um, doing Medicine Buddha practice, um, reciting um, sutras. Um, we just did the Heart Sutra. Uh, what else? And also just doing uh, meditations with people, you know, trying to just guide people and help them kind of be in a more relaxed, kind of calm place. And so we had. Uh, at this center here, we had talked about, um, at one point, we had talked about how um, it'd be nice to have like a practice group, you know, that did, um, you know, pra you know, um, sadhanas like Medicine Buddha, where we could like meet together and then maybe even go to people's houses, you know, if, if they requested it, you know, to be able to um, offer that, you know, if that was something that people wanted. So, um, let me see if I forgot anything. Oh yeah, so the other thing too that um, that I wanted to talk about too is that um, you know there's there's teachings about like death and impermanence and um, and actual meditations that lead us through these kind of visualizations about death and impermanence. And again, it's it's not like um, we're trying to be like more more a bit about like this this focus on death but the whole point is is that it's um it's trying to help us kind of realize that um you know our we may not have a lot of time to practice you know and i i really um i really enjoy these this kind of meditation and so i'll, I'll just read through the contemplation point of it just briefly but the whole idea is that we um we do a contemplation that um that helps us get a concept really firmly in our minds and so the contemplation for this meditation is um we think to ourselves that i will definitely die there is no way to prevent my body from finally decaying day by day moment by moment my life is slipping away i have no idea that when when i will die the time of death is completely uncertain many young people die before their parents some die the moment they are born there is no certainty in this world Furthermore, there are so many causes of untimely death. The lives of many strong and healthy people are destroyed by accident. There is no guarantee that I will not die today. And so the whole point is, is that, um, you know, you meditate on this topic and then you, until you get a really strong feeling for it, and then you try to hold that feeling, you know, that, that like, I could die at any moment. And it's not, the whole point is not to get yourself all fearful. But the point is, is to really like be able to go, you know what, I need to really savor like this place that I have in my life right now. You know, I need to not like procrastinate. I need to like embrace the people that I love and that I'm close to. And I need to use this energy to like really like fuel my Dharma practice and not um, and not be lazy and waste time. And so I think I think sometimes people that are terminal have a little bit of this, you know, they have something that that seems kind of like it. Um, it's a special quality that they have that that their lives they they all of a sudden are gra are grateful for, and th and that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to find. We're not trying to be um, you know morbid or or depressive or even get people fearful. The interesting thing about this this meditation, I've done this when I've had all this kind of emotional disturbances in my life. Like I, I'm really fearful of some future thing that's going on, and you know how am I gonna like do this, or you know how's it, how am I gonna deal with this situation? And when I do this meditation, that stuff just like melts away, not not permanently, but it melts away for a while. It's like it really, it really puts a, um, 
a pin in all that energy that the fearful energy about you know the the future that i kind of get freaked out about sometimes so in terms of all what i have to say i'm kind of close to the end of what i what my talk um is and so you know what it, it would be nice if people wanted to share some experience that they had because i think that um you know we all have experiences in this um in this realm of like you know having at least family members or um or people that we've known and then also um i don't know how to what, what are some of the things that you think might be beneficial for people at the time of their death you know what can we do to try to help people i mean that's the bottom line is like what can we do to try to to help people have a smoother transition so thanks thanks brad you got it I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that piece um, and that I, I also like how there are different forms of death almost mm -hmm. and that that anxiety state that you were talking about because um, you know I know our culture kind of we don't like to look at it we don't want to see it we don't want to deal with it it's such a downer right? mm -hmm. <laughs> but yet nobody gets out alive and then the sort of irrational catastrophizing that happens in my head right. like like well, if I don't do this, then I'm going to get fired. And if I get fired, I'm not going to have any money. And then I'm going to be on the street and then I'm going to starve to death or I'm going to get a disease. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like this, eventually it leads to death. And so that contemplation that you just read, it kind of, it's interesting how it kind of melts that. Mm -hmm. And and it's another way of dealing, just different ways into dealing with the idea of death or not getting something or something coming to an end. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Appreciate that. You got it. Thanks. Testing. No. Okay. Um, in response to your inquiry about what are some things we can do, one thing that comes to my mind is establish a pattern before the loved one dies of fulfilling commitments and keeping your word, because that will transmit like that their wishes will be honored once they're gone and they don't have to worry about like who's going to do this who's going to do that if you're you know supposed to be there yeah be there if you're supposed to be the cat be the cat and um it and i think it's also beneficial to the doer right yeah because it's like okay i'm doing it when you do something good you see the good in, in others yeah, thanks, Greg. That's good. Having, um, you know, talking about the circumstances and, and different obligations that people have, or I had this idea too that when I was giving, when I was getting ready to give this talk of like, it would be nice to be able to die with like a clean slate, you know what I mean? And like, be able to like talk to family members about things that were troubling and, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I don't know about your family, but with my family, it's like sometimes it's just like this big mess of all these people with all these problems with each other and resentments. And and it would be nice to just, before you get to that point of where you're like terminal, to be able to just sit down with people and have like constructive like conversations and 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 talk about those things that are like really bothering you. And it, it And I've tried to do that a little bit. I mean, I've tried to have this idea of like, of like, you know, make an amends to the people that I that I've harmed or or uh, or talking to people. And the problem is, though, is like sometimes that I mean, it takes a lot of wisdom to go to people and to try to lay it all out and to to try to resolve things. And the problem is the other person may not want to resolve it or the other person may not be in that space. But uh, I think that um, I think that's a worthwhile thing. And then also even better than resolving conflict, not creating more conflict. You know, I mean, and that's the Dharma practice, right? Like, how can we not create more conflict so that we, so that we don't have to sit on our deathbed and go, man, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You know, I wish I wouldn't have harmed that person, you know? And so, yeah, maybe that's the, maybe that's the good news going forward. We can try to, you know, we can feel good about that. And then the other thing too, it's funny, I keep remembering other things. The other thing too, is we, we have to kind of build some confidence in our practice. You know, and if we don't have confidence going into these really hard situations, 
we're just going to kind of like melt or fall apart, you know? And I, um, you know, I had a, I had an episode where my wife got really sick and, and I was really like pushed in this extreme way. And it was like, I felt like, wow, like this stuff really works. You know, these concepts work. We're not just talking about some, you know, philosophical concepts, you know, we're talking about practicing and then, and watching, you know, your mind react and, and your, you know, the change is happening. So, so I think uh, confidence in training and, uh, and then I even like, I even like your idea of the plan. It's kind of, or what I'm hearing, Greg, is like a plan, having like a plan, you know, like, like uh, if we're really contemplating death, you know, like me, to, maybe an example is me telling my wife, you know what, if I'm like on my deathbed, invite all these people over, you know, let's, let's have all these pujas and like recite all these texts and let's, you know, this is what I want, you know, this is what I need for support, you know? So anyway, any, anybody else have any comments or any go for it? Thanks, Brad, for that for that talk because uh, your story and my story are very similar. Um, I lost my mother three months ago to mm. pancreatic cancer. So, um, but I in, uh, to answer or at least pose maybe a couple answers to your query about how to make it easier for someone who's about to pass, or even ourselves. There's probably one is to meditate. I think, and you something that I usually do when I when I go to the park and do a walking meditation is to meditate on my own death. You know, what would it be like mm -hmm. if once I'm not here? And um, plenty of images come to my mind as to what I experienced with my, with my siblings and some of my, my relatives as to what I saw, you know. But the other thing I think that's important also for people to maybe try to inculcate in their minds is, is not bear any grudges towards anyone. Mm -hmm. Because that's something that I mean, I'm not sure about the dynamics of it all, and that's something I'm still learning. But it's something that you don't necessarily. Well, I think that you don't necessarily want to take with you <laughs> yeah. when you go on. So yeah, and so that's what I have to say. So thank you very much. All right, thanks. Anybody else? I think the um, the summary too in a. Uh, in the, this book, How to Enjoy Death, is, is uh, Lama Zopa talks about like dying with a good heart. And he uses this example in a lot of different ways. He, one of the stories that he tells is about when he's in the monastery, there were, um, you know, there are a lot of really like, like, you know, smart and like um, monks that like have memorized everything and they're really, um, they're really knowledgeable. And he said that then there are some monks that are really super ordinary and that that maybe aren't able to memorize very many things, but they, um, they have a really good heart. And he said that, uh, he said that like, that's more important, you know, than having all this knowledge, you know, if, is having a good heart. And, and, uh, and so I think, you know, that's probably a good place to close. I mean, and the, and the point is, is that we're trying to train ourselves to have a good heart. It's not like, it's not like it's something that just happens, you know, oh, this, I remember before I was a, a Buddhist, I would, I would think, Oh, this person's just compassionate, you know. Oh, this person's just this way. Well, we, you know, we train ourselves to be compassionate. You know, we we don't, you know, it's not like we're, you know, we're we have this inherent quality. And then the last thing um, that I wanted to talk about before we um, close is like, you know, who's dying? You know, you know, I mean, what? Who is dying? You know, that's the big question. You know, and a lot of times it feels like it's our body that's like you know, that we're kind of afraid that, you know, it's the, all this physical stuff, but it's really, I think a lot of the fear comes from this, this mental thought of having, of, of, uh, this concept of who we think we are, you know, and all these things that we attach to who we think we are, you know, and it's, and so I think that's the, um, that's the ongoing, uh, question is who is it that that's actually dying, you know? So thanks. Hey, Brad. Brad, this is Susan. Um, there's some hands up on the Zoom. Okay, all right, that'd be great. So um, I think Dirk had his hand up. Oh, that's funny. I haven't. I don't have a screen, so I can't. Really... Susan's hand is up. 
Yeah. I did. Yes, one. I did. I did have oh, my hand. We can't hear you, Susan, but give us this. Or you're muted, I think. And also Dirk. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Go, for, Dirk. go ahead, Dirk. Thanks for your talk. I, I have a lot, of, lot in common with you on that stuff. Uh, when my mother died, I was able to spend six weeks sitting at her bedside. Um, holding her hand and there was a lot of discussion of course about whether she should go on life support even though she was no longer conscious at that point she was no longer conscious at all and the nurses uh or who i really appreciated because they were very supportive about that but her husband was really clinging to her and really insistent um that we do anything we can to keep her around as long as possible. And I knew my mother, I, I had a very close relationship with my mother. So at one point, everybody had left the room and I said, mom, if you wanna go, you should just go, we'll be okay. And she died right then, right at that moment when I said that to her. And now I got that from uh, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by Sogi Rinpoche. I mean, he's he has since come un, under fire, but I still think that book is a masterpiece, uh, and it was uh, very important for me to deal with it. But your other story about your uh, extended grief with your mother reminded me. You know, there's this. I, I don't remember which sutta it is in the Pali Canon, but there was a, a a woman whose child died, and she was in consulate. She 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 wouldn't even let them take the child the dead child from her she just kept the dead child with her she was so attached to it finally somebody convinced her to go talk to buddha and he told her she she said will you will you bring my child back alive and he said well i will bring your child back alive if you do this and he told her to go to every household every house in the village and when she found a house where no one close to somebody had died, that at that point, he would bring her child back alive. Of course, she didn't talk to anybody who hadn't had a death, hadn't had a loss. And that freed her from it, realizing that other people had the same issue that she had. Anyway, thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. Thanks for your comments. All right, who would like to go next? Or I'll let you. Um, hey, Brad, this is Susan. And also, I yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I mean, it's a, a really important subject, and uh, you have a, 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 a wealth of perspectives on it. So thanks very much. Um, you did mention one thing um, that was sort of tangential that we were, you and I had talked about, and we've also talked to Lama about putting together some sort of a cadre of, of people who can go and to people's homes when they are ill or um, in need of, of, of people to come and sit with them and have practice and just be with them. So yeah, we're, we're working on, on doing something like that. But the, the other component of that same thing is having Sangha members being open enough to their own pain and their own suffering that they want to have company and support. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a two-way street, really, for... Not, you know, no, I'm not talking about actively dying, but um, just needing support um, during a time of illness or a great grief. Um, and so we need to reach out to each other when we are needing to have support. And then we'll be there, right? We, we can be there for other people. But it's very difficult um, when a person is in pain and in grief, and then they just close down and just um, cannot experience it in community, can only experience it alone. And that's that can be devastating. So I'm just sort of making a, 
uh, I guess, a plea for folks to consider that if you are needing help, that you ask for it. We're there for you, right? So anyway, that's all I had to say. All right, thanks, Susan. That's a, that's a good point. How about Ellen? Yeah, Brad, thank you. Um, I also appreciated your talk and a couple of things resonated with me as well. And one of them, one of the things you said was uh, sitting next to your mother and, you know, doing practice. And it reminded me that I did the same thing when my mother was home on hospice. And in fact, Lama Jimpa had instructed me that the most important thing to do is to keep doing your practice, which feels quite counterintuitive. Um, you know, when somebody's dying, you think you should stop everything and do what they need or something but boy you're so right it was just i don't know how or why but it was calming i think for me and just for her she had no idea again she was probably asleep or what have you and i was silently doing my practice that she had no really connection with but boy it just shifts things so it is incredible when we're a stand you know and and i was i wasn't even doing it really i was only doing it as Jim but told me to do it i wouldn't have known to do that on my own. So that was incredible. And the other thing I heard in, in your talk, and then Dirk sort of reemphasized it with his uh, sutra story, is that we think our grief is personal. You know, we think we sort of own it and it's a personal grief. And it's so not, you know, it's such a universal thing. And when one gets in touch with how everybody, it's really a universal thing and it's not a personal thing, it really does sort of open open me up I know and it sounded like it did that for you so thank you for sharing that story and your you know your discussion with your colleague uh, I think that's really helpful so thank you all right thanks Ellen all right last chance <laughs> all right with that then we'll um we'll do our closing prayers here Om Araya Pazaya Nayandi Om Araya Pazaya Nayandi